Welcome, everyone. So we're going to have a panel discussion on different perspectives and angles about buying a software that already works and integrating it with your own offering versus building it in-house. So we have different examples and cases. I'm very honored to be joined by three product leaders. So without any further ado, I would love for each of you to introduce yourself. So please, Varun. Hey, um, so I'm the co-founder and CEO of Hansel. Um, I think in the morning we had a great session from Nir. Uh, he talked about distractions. Now, if you actually look at your product, it's nothing but a bundle of distractions for a user, right? There's just so many things that a user can do at a given point in time, like click here, go there, scroll, whatever, right? How do you make your product indestructible? And that's what we specialize at Hansel. We use the power of what we call as nudges to make sure that a certain choice is elevated for a user at a certain point in time, such that the user kind of like goes through the funnel for that point in time. So that's what we do at Hansel. And uh, before Hansel, um, you know, I started my career, I, had a, I have a very sort of like different career. So I started my career programming robots at ABB. Um, I had a short stint at uh, HSBC investment banking. Uh, wasn't my cup of tea. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I am a career product manager. I was in Zynga as a product manager, you know, during their and after their IPO. So it was a crazy ride there. Um, I was a product manager in the Flipkart team, um, again, after their CDC. So I saw the whole rise there. So it was interesting. And I've been doing this for the last couple of years. I've been working on Hansel um, for the last couple of years. So that's about me. Hi, I'm Gina Lee. Um, so I'm actually currently a product uh, strategy consultant working with uh, startups and, and established companies. But uh, prior to that, I was uh, most recently at Priceline. Um, if you guys remember William Shatner from <laughs> uh, back in the 90s. Um, so Priceline's a travel booking platform um, offering the best deals in the travel market. Um, and when I was there, I was the uh, head of um, the site experience product. So um, our focus was really about um, optimizing the search and entry experience for uh, people that were uh, basically new to Priceline or, or trying to book their travel. Um, so I was there for about two and a half years. Um, prior to that, I spent um, most of my career, 12 year career, uh, product career in the media industry. Um, so I was at Condé Nast, uh, working on Teen Vogue and Condé Nast Traveler. Um, I was also at Time Inc. before that, uh, working on InStyle.com, um, at The Knot, um, working on a wedding, helping brides plan their weddings. And then um, I had started my career at PCMag.com, uh, integrating e-commerce um, into product reviews. So I, you know, have kind of dabbled in e-commerce throughout the years, but you know, uh, primarily spent most of my career in media. Um, so pretty interesting, varied <laughs> background. Um, hey all, uh, I'm Natwar. I work with a company called Logi Analytics. Um, in past, I have run my own startup uh, for four years. I sold it earlier last year. Uh, before that, dabbled with hardware and software. Um, been in technology, building products, selling products for 10 years, more than 10 years now. Uh, but yeah, uh, worked on like Android 1.1 and things like that. So uh, fun times. Cool. Well, thank you for joining us. And um, I have a set of questions ready for the panelists here, but I would also love to get some questions from the audience. So if you want to ask something, please use Slido.com and um, go to the tab that says uh, questions or Q&A and ask yours. And then you also have the option to upvote your favorite questions. So we'll crowdsource the best and uh, we'll shoot them away to you guys. So my first question to you is, uh, of your core company stack or product stack, get, you, you get to pick whatever you want. Let's say A-B testing tools, data analytics, CRM, whatever works for you. Can you just share some examples in your current company or previous companies about what are some of those products that you decided to build in-house versus which products you decided to, to buy from third-party vendors? Yeah, so um, I think it, it kind of like boils down to the stage and culture of the company. Um, so at Zynga, for instance, um, we had this massive infrastructure of you know, analytics and segmentation, experimentation, all built in-house, uh, stood the test of time. In fact, I think they've just revamped it. I don't know, it's called EORs or something. They've just revamped it, but it's all built in-house. So in Zynga, it's all about like, hey, if it's going to like touch my core product experience, I would rather build it. Now, 
In my startup, however, I think I'm like really aggressively pushing for, uh, you know, like getting the buy mentality set. I've been on both sides of the table, and uh, um, you know, I'd like to think of any product, no matter how small it looks, as like an iceberg. You have no idea what is lurking beneath it unless you go deep into it. So it might seem really simple to start off, but then you know you have APIs, you have front end, you have back end, you have dashboards, you have contracts, you have services, and it's something that you would not want to touch unless it's something that's going to affect your business, uh, something in your building, right? So um, you know, right from documentation, CMSs to you know road mapping tools to project management to analytics, we've completely brought stuff in our current startup. So it's something that I'm setting up as a culture in our company. Um, and, and I don't see this changing unless, you know, there are financial considerations later on, but yeah, it's, it's just going to be buy for us. Um, I totally agree with you uh, about um, kind of protecting your core technology um, and, and having that built in-house. Um, when I was at Priceline, I would say about 90 to 95% of the technology was uh, built and owned in-house. Um, the core, you know, from the core uh, booking experience up until even our A-B testing platform, similar to um, Zynga. Um, I guess some examples of vendors that we use are really for kind of like ancillary uh, needs, for instance, like fraud protection. Um, if we had social marketing campaigns, we would use a vendor for that. Um, and then like, for instance, for our customer service, uh, our live chat uh, chat bot, we used a third party for that. Um, and at Condé Nast, we're a little bit more open to using um, third party platforms and vendors. Um, we were uh, primarily, uh, so Connie Nass is a media company, so our core technology is really our CMS, um, our content management system, our video platform, as well as um, a lot of our kind of ad, ad technology. Um, but then a lot of kind of like the, the customer ex or the user experiences that layer it on top of the, the front end of the site would end up being um, utilizing third party vendors um, such as like our commenting, I think we use LiveFire, um, and like our affiliate linking um, was all handled by Skimlink. So uh, a lot of the consumer facing experiences that we didn't have like the core technology or, or knowledge of you know, how to build, um, we, used, we would use uh, third party vendors for, for that. I mean, um, I have similar thoughts, but what I've seen is in reality, a lot of times um, when you have companies that have been running for some time, um, you have certain things that, you know, someone decided to build and now you're kind of maintaining it. So, uh, so we are in the process of moving some of these things out. Uh, for example, developer documentation or, you know, support ticketing, like it's such a basic use case, but... Ten years ago, when someone had to decide, uh, they decided otherwise, and which made sense at the time. So, I would say what, what what Varun also said that you know, depending upon what stage the company is in, and a lot of you, I believe, are maintaining some of those uh, things that someone decided to build instead of buying uh, an external solution. So, uh, yeah, I mean, my preference, yeah, buy as much as you can, uh, but uh, the reality is a little different than that. Cool. Well, thank you, and I'm sure you all went through similar decision-making process. Obviously, there are differences depending on the product, but I would love to get uh, to pick Gina's brain first and then whoever wants to jump in. Like, What are the main variables that you consider when you are in between buying versus building? Um, yeah, so kind of in my experience, sometimes it just feels like it just make like it's just obvious what you should be doing, but um, when I really think about some of the major factors, um, I could think of like four uh, ones that I've really thought about um, through my experience. So the first one um, is, you know, if you're trying to build a new feature or product, um, does the vendors that are in that space have some sort of specialized access or specialized technology or special relationship um, in the space uh, that you're not going to, is going to be more difficult for you to achieve? So for example, when I was at Teen Vogue, uh, we had a lot of social media campaigns um, utilizing Instagram and Twitter and hashtagging. Um, and uh, one of our vendors had a very special relationship with these social platforms and had special whitelisting access and um, firehose access to their data, which you know, for us, I don't even know how we would have <laughs> gotten that access. So um, um, it was just an absolute natural fit to, to work with that vendor there. And you know, it was like a successful relationship. Um, another factor, that I've uh, really uh, faced is um, um, if there's like an unvalidated hypothesis for a feature or um, 
a product that you're thinking about building. So for instance, um, when I was at Condé Nast Traveler, oh, so Condé Nast Traveler is primarily a travel content website, so people that come there are reading articles about their favorite um, the favorite hotels or like you know, the ne next best place to visit, but we didn't really have any travel booking capabilities on the site. So, um, you know, we had a hypothesis that, you know, these, these readers, they, they might want to book travel and that means we can make some money off of these, uh, these users if, if we offer that uh, as a feature. So rather than, you know, building it up front, uh, we partnered with a company called Button um, who basically connects um, different apps, booking apps, uh, with your website or your app. So we used them. We, we uh, did kind of a small beta um, and implemented on, on all of our uh, mobile uh, experience. And um, it ended up being like a very successful test. And uh, we ended up kind of uh, blowing that out into a bigger experience site-wide um, later on. Um, another factor uh, that I faced in the past um, is urgency and kind of like what does your uh, tech resourcing look like. So um, an example there also at Condé Nast, uh, we would sell a lot of uh, advertising campaigns and a lot of times those campaigns have very short timelines. So that, you know, that was like the main source of revenue for that business. So they would have these very short timelines um, and also um, not only that, uh, you know, these kind of big blown out custom experiences for these advertisers that we would need to build in, you know, just like a two, three week time period. And of course, our, our core tech teams are, are focused on other, other um, priorities. So we would uh, frequently use uh, vendors and agencies to help us build those out quickly. Um, and I think lastly, uh, kind of flipping it around to the buy mentality, um, the times I've seen that uh, it really makes sense to buy and it kind of echoes what we've already already talked about is, um, you know, does the technology you're going to build give you a competitive advantage versus what's already on the shelf? And, you know, uh, is that going to help you uh, achieve business impact and um, make you uh, unique in your space and, and have competitive advantage? So, for instance, for Priceline, it's like Zynga for uh, Condé Nast, um, you know, the core technology is really uh, what, what we own and put all our resources into. Um, and so I think you know the competitive advantage is really what you have to think about when you're when you're making that decision to, to build. You know, uh, uh, Yeah, I mean, a core competency is something that uh, I always think about. If that's your core competency, if that's your core uh, value prop, I mean, they go kind of hand in hand. They should, if they don't. Uh, that's something that I would prefer to build in house. Uh, another important thing is time to market. A lot of times. Like at least when I was building products, a lot of times you just have decided for whatever reason that something needs to go out very quickly. Um, if you can do it by just buying something and testing it out very quickly, uh, I would do that. Uh, another important thing is where do we see product in future, right? Not just our product, but also what are we buying? Uh, so what kind of roadmap do they have, right? What, how stable that company is? What happens if something breaks down? Because things are going to break down. That's just part of the deal. Um, is it in, like, can I actually call someone and get someone on phone? Or can I get someone to fix this? Or do I have competency inside my team to, to fix this? Um, I've, I've, I've gone through these uh, you know, very painful cycles of getting something, and then it's part of your product. And then it goes down, and it takes everything down with it. Uh, not the smartest thing, you know, but <laughs> I've done that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, the, I mean, a lot of times, figure out, figuring out what's the worst case scenario and just making, taking steps to make sure that that doesn't happen is very helpful. <laughs> like, what if this thing breaks? What will happen then? Uh, and just thinking about that while making that decision is helpful. All right. So can you give us an example of when you had to make a decision about build versus buy and guide us through the whole decision making process from I have an idea all the way to implementation and hopefully tell us a little more about who else is involved. Obviously the PM is, is, is a key piece but it's not the only one. So just shed some light here if you can. Um, I could take, take this one. So um, kind of uh, mentioned uh, my experience with Condé Nast Traveler 
uh, prior where we tried out that uh, test with button. So um, kind of going to the next step, we uh, as a team decided we had this hypothesis that we could you know, actually put travel booking across the entire site experience and, and you know, that could be a sizable revenue source aside from just advertising uh, going forward. So um, what we did in uh, planning out what this could look like was um, we kind of surveyed a few different um, OTAs, like, like a Priceline, Expedia, Booking. Um, so we, we looked at a few different OTAs and, and looked at their capabilities. And um, essentially, we kind of had three potential plans. Um, the plan A was, um, OK, so we do as little development as possible, but we work with one of these partners and see if we can just um, have, we drop JavaScript on the site or put something that can basically scrape our content and then link directly out um, every time that you mention a hotel or um, you know any sort of property, you know, link out, and then you're taking out of uh, the Connie Nash Traveler experience, and then you can book on this uh, this site. So some of the I guess drawbacks of that approach um, would be that you know you're taken off the site experience, and then getting the user back is going to be difficult, and then there might be a little bit of you know confusion as 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 they've entered a different experience. Um, but I guess the benefit for that would have been it was very, very quick um, uh, time to market. Uh, the second option we looked at was um, utilizing white label solutions. So most of these travel brands have a white label version of their web experience. Um, so you can essentially take kind of a stripped down version of booking.com, let's say, and, and basically slap your logo on there and, and change some colors and maybe some fonts. Um, and so that requires a little bit more development effort. Um, so we looked at that as like another option. Um, and <clears throat> being a media company, branding is extremely important. So uh, that wasn't the most desired option just because it, it felt like a kind of like a halfway between having it fully integrated on the site versus just linking out. Um, but we looked at it as an, another option and that also had a little bit higher in terms of development costs um, and then also a longer time to market. And then the user experience was not um, going to be obviously ideal. And then the third option was like a full API integration with one of these uh, partners. Um, and obviously a full API integration means the site experience, the user experience is 100% bespoke to your brand, but then at the same time, the development costs were going to be like four or five times, uh, and it was going to take probably like six months plus to integrate an experience like that. So um, basically when we, when we were looking at these three options, we looked at the trade-offs between cost, time to market, user experience, and then also, like as I mentioned earlier about unproven hypotheses, we, we didn't even know if this was going to make that much money for us to justify the cost to go kind of real, that real API ideal route. So um, when we weighed all those options and discussed as a team with you know, tech design research and business, um, we came to the conclusion that um, maybe the, the easiest, uh, fastest time to market version would be the best next step. And then um, actually, if you go on their site today, there are links out to booking.com. So that's, um, it's, it seems to be working out for them now. Mm -hmm. um, you guys want to jump in? Anything? I, mean, I, I think I think you covered it with an example. Um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't add anything anymore. I think that was perfect. All right. So how do you go about finding the right vendor? There are obviously big players out there, but then you also have these scrappy startups who's willing to do all, all the way to customize their product for you. Do you actually consider early stage startups? Do you try for the vendors to bend and make any special features for you? And like, Really, how do you go about, you know, like just picking that right vendor? Uh, I mean, uh, it really depends. I, a lot of these questions, right, the answer is it depends. It depends on if how important that thing is for you that you're trying to do. I was a very early adopter of Mixpanel and Heap, which both are here. I was a very early adopter for uh, Intercom. All these products, right, they've been, when they were all startups. Um, but none of them could, would break my application. So I was absolutely OK to try these things. And I knew that if, if they work, it will be a huge upside for me as a product person, right? So I, if it's a very small downside and a huge upside, yes, I'm going to try it. Uh, so yes, startups are definitely in, in there. But, but for example, if I'm going to, like for example, backups. Uh, I also in, uh, was a huge early adopter of uh, DigitalOcean. I don't know how many of you know that. 
but it's just, it's like AWS, but it's a cheaper version. <laughs> and you know, it's not as reliable, but, but for backup, I, I relied on that uh, for my backup servers and things like that. So uh, depending upon what kind of things you're trying to do, startups are definitely, I mean, of course, and my love for startups, because I was a startup, so I would always try that. Now that I work for a, a much bigger company, uh, we do try things that are from smaller companies and startups, but we have a different criteria. We, we do look for some kind of stability. We do, do look for how, how often do they upgrade their own stuff, how often are they um, uh, pushing out new uh, you know, uh, product, how often are they updating their API documentation, things like that. So uh, depending upon what you're trying to do, I think, uh, I think giving a chance to startups is definitely a go for me. Yeah, I mean, uh, Essentially, there are just two kinds of businesses, right? So one is a keyword-led business. The other one is a non-keyword-led business. So keyword-led businesses are things that are out there. There's a market, there are a lot of vendors out there. Um, and some of the frameworks you would use to evaluate those kind of businesses, I mean, like that we talked about, like we have, uh, you know, you talk about pricing, you talk about feature list, you have credibility scores and so on and so forth. But where all of this breaks down is where you talk to startups in the non-keyword-led models where it doesn't exist. They're probably solving something specific and niche. Uh, I think it all boils down to, like Natwar said, like how important that problem is to you uh, at that point in time. But that framework actually has to come from the vendor. Um, counterintuitively, it has to come from the vendor because, A, they have gone through this process before, and you, you probably do not have the right sort of framework to evaluate whether to go ahead with this one or there probably is not someone else yet, right? So when that happens, I think it's important to kind of like sit across the table and actually develop the framework with the vendor. Uh, and of course, today, I mean, in this day and age, the, uh, the buyer is basically the stronger one in the table. So there's just so much of information floating around. So it'll be really easy for you to figure out if the vendor is just like pushing something out and, you know, like it's, it, it's kind of like easy to figure out. But when you look at the second type of business is solving something really specific and niche for you, uh, which is not yet a keyword yet on Google, uh, the onus of the framework actually has to come from the vendor. So I want to flip the question to you, because sometimes you are the vendor for other companies, right? Or your company, Hansel. So how do you go about negotiating with enterprise clients that may want something that you are not currently offering on the website? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, uh, it's kind of like easy to fall in the trap of uh, saying yes to everything. Uh, I mean, the most important thing is if it actually becomes, so if there is a customization request that becomes a potential selling point for you in the future, it makes absolute sense for you to sort of like bring it up in your roadmap and do it right away. Uh, and also, obviously, that pleases the uh, customer there saying, oh, these guys are doing something specifically for me. But if there's something that's so unique to this customer, I would probably differ, and I would probably not do it, uh, purely because it becomes more of a services business and it actually, actually does not really enhance your product as much as uh, you would want. So it's, it, it really boils down to like how scalable that feature request is going to be. Uh, right, and, and pretty much, I mean, we do entertain customization requests, but yeah, it, it just boils down to like whether you can sell that later on to other people. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Now, let's say um, you are thinking about building something in house. I want to know more about those risks. Are you thinking? How are you thinking about maintenance, training for? Let's just think about an in-house product, something that you want your employees to use. So, how do you go about maintaining that product, allocating resources? training and onboarding the actual users or employees to make sure that you get that buy-in. Um, do you have some examples you can share? Uh, sure. Uh, the, the products that you build or buy for inside the company, for internal audience, the thought process is just different. The, the, go -to, <laughs> the GTM for that would be totally different, right? Uh, and I have succeeded and failed both uh, on this. Um, the, the number one thing if you can get, uh, and I have thought about this uh, in detail, uh, the number one thing that you can get is, is executive buy-in. If you can get, for any internal product that you want your peers and the rest of the company to use, if you have executive buy-in, that's the best thing. That's the best thing to do. Uh, another great thing that works or helps is, 
whatever they're using today, that has an end date. One day, that access is gonna go away, right? If that's the case, people will switch. I mean, they might not like you for it, but they will switch. Um, another thing that helped was uh, we, we did it with a very small team. Uh, I used to work in R&D at a biopharma, biopharma company, so we did just cell culture, just a piece of uh, research, a piece, very small team of research, just 70 scientists. We did a lot of work with them. We proved that it is saving them a lot of time and effort, and their error rate went down. So we proved that case internally very, in a very small way, and then we were able to kind of take it to 700 scientists, like right away. When we presented the case, they were like, it's a no-brainer. Doesn't matter whether people like it or not, it's a no-brainer. So uh, depending upon, uh, if it's internal use case, yes, executive buy-in, uh, you know, small, proving it the small thing, and take away the, the current thing that they're taking, <laughs> that they're doing right now, uh, it would, would definitely be helpful. I mean, uh, just just an example from you know what Natva talked about uh, testing with small teams, right? Like, I mean, at Zynga, I think about six, seven years ago, when we introduced subscriptions and social gaming, um, it was supposedly a high revenue uh, feature, and it was really important for us to actually test it with a couple of games, uh, bring out some of the best practices in, and then sort of move it towards the entire sort of like, you know, suite of games that we had at that time. Um, I think that that point sort of like resonated with me because I went through that, went through those motions where, you know, it, it, especially if it's something that's going to be adopted by a larger uh, set of teams, it's, it's really important to test it out with one team for however long it takes to bring out the use case, uh, bring out the impact, uh, technical and otherwise, and then, and then bring out the best practices from there and then move on. Right. And I also think it's really important to have a, I mean, this is probably what Natwish said when, he's, when, he, when he said, uh, you know, uh, buy-in from your exec. In other words, it's like, it's like similar to having an internal champion when you're selling something to, I mean, to another mm -hmm. person. So it's, it's, I mean, having an influencer sort of becomes the internal champion for you. Uh, I think it's really important to figure out who that's going to be, uh, the higher they are. Uh, the better it is for you to like push through and you know make it easier. Um, yeah. All right. So I have a last question before I open the floor to the audience. So this is for everyone. Just give me an example of when you had to make a switching decision from a product that you either had to buy or build before. So what are the challenges you had to deal with? I could start. Um, so this is more for. Uh, product management tools that we were using um, at one of my previous companies. Uh, so everybody here is probably familiar with Jira and Trello. So uh, one of my previous companies, uh, we would basically keep switching between platforms um, every year. So you would build your entire backlog and all your sprints and you know, you'd be managing your, you know, your team and your product uh, using one of the platforms and then I don't know, there would be like a, a management change. And it's like, okay, everybody, we're, we're changing from Jira to Trello now. So you have like a week to do it. And then, you know, we're like, okay, so now we have to spend the next week clearing up the backlog, <laughs> moving everything over. Um, it, it literally happened, I think, like four times at one of the companies I worked at. So I became like expert at moving from Jira to Trello and Trello to Jira. <laughs> um, but what I'd say, you know, some of the switching costs that we face, and I think this is probably applicable to any any migration in software is, um, you know, there's definitely some um, loss in some of the content and the data and some of the stuff that, um, you know, just didn't really fit when you moved one thing to the other. Um, and also, you know, you lose a feature set. So, you know, in Trello, you, you, I don't know if you can today, but you couldn't really like search easily through the content. You couldn't really do bulk changes, but Jira had those options. So, you know, losing some of the, the features that you, you had gotten accustomed to is another uh, risk. And then, um, yeah, and then just like the onboarding time because people have to learn these new softwares and, you know, that takes time and getting kind of back into the groove of running your sprints and cleaning up your backlog. You know, when you switch between platforms, your whole workflow changes. So, um, yeah, switching costs definitely <laughs> are high when you're, when you're going between platforms. I mean, um I haven't kind of like, I mean, I don't have an example personally, but I've seen one of our customers, they had this infrastructure that they 
built over years. What was interesting was um, it wasn't really the challenge of you know like product and you know technicalities and you know uh, the switching costs. <laughs> like what is really surprising was it was the challenge was cultural. So you had a team that actually built this for a couple of years. It's kind of like the baby, and then here's somebody who's saying, hey, you know what? Kind of like can you switch from whatever you've been building over the last couple of years and you know move into this. So it was, I mean, that, that was a challenge that we kind of like did not anticipate. Maybe we were, we were noobs, but we did not anticipate that to be a challenge. But that was, that was an interesting challenge. And today we obviously have a sort of like a playbook from a couple of those experiences on, you know, how to deal with that. But, uh, but that's something that we don't really generally think about, you know, especially when it comes to switching from uh, whatever you've built to something that you're going to like uh, get from someone else or some other team that has built it. So there's this whole sense of you know ego that gets hurt so it's it's important to kind of like move through that um, i would say uh, one thing that works out really well if you have built something and then you are going out for whatever reason you have decided to not use it or stop using it and going to go buy an ex external product you really have clear requirements that's uh, that's the best thing about it i mean all the work that you have put in you know exactly what you need most of the times but, but that's a good thing. Like, that's one great thing. In fact, at Logi, when that, like, that happens a lot. Anyone who has tried to build something, when they come and they see the platform, like, yeah, you know, this makes sense. We tried to do these things. It was hard, and that's it. Uh, but at the same time, I've made, in my last startup, I, I, I don't know why, but I decided to, uh, so I was in SMB space. Let me just give you some context. It was in, my last startup was in small and medium-sized businesses, and a lot of SMB customers do come from recommendations from others. And I was getting a decent amount of customers from, from recommendations. And then I decided, I'm like, OK, you know what? I'm going to start rewarding my customers. At that time, I was not rewarding my customers. Uh, like, I'm going to start rewarding them. That means I need an affiliate program. Basically, that's what affiliate programs do. And for whatever reason, and don't ask me why, I decided to build it. There were at least 10 good software, <laughs> uh, softwares out there that I could have just used. But no, I decided to build it. And I really thought it would be a week worth of work with my engineering team. And he's laughing because he knows nothing, no such thing. But uh, we ended up spending four and a half, five weeks on it. And even after pushing it out, just maintaining it in, after six months, I actually, like, one day we got frustrated. And we, like, in six months, we just shut it down. We bought a software, uh, just plug, plugged it in. And it was in two days, it was up and running. So. Uh, it was just, uh, you know, it's just one of those failures that you kind of have to write it down and keep reading. Like every year I go back to it and I read it. I'm like, okay, you know, you do these things. Remember this. So uh, the only good thing is you know exactly what you need, but uh -huh. <laughs> the, the cost you pay is very high. Great. Well, I have uh, time for two, three questions. The power of crowdsourcing is incredible. You know what the <laughs> top, the, the highest voted question is, is, is a hot dog a sandwich? Um, <laughs> No, no need to, no need to answer that one. I'll pick, num I'll pick number two. Um, so, have, have you ever encountered a security issue when utilizing a third party? Are there any red flags or rules of thumb that you suggest when doing risk assessment? Can you repeat the question one more time? Yeah. So have you ever encountered a security issue when utilizing a third party vendor? And if there is any red flags or rules of thumb that you would suggest when doing risk assessment? I can take it. Uh, oh. I mean, it, uh, it really depends um, how are you using that product internally. Uh, and security risk, security threat can be multiple things. It could be as, as simple as you're putting someone else's JavaScript code in, and that's vulnerability. Uh, you can you are putting a form that is not checking for basic things, uh, or it could be the fact that you are replicating your all of your security policies for all the users, and that has a gap. So it it really depends, but there is no one rule. At least not in my experience, there is no one rule that can kind of just define it all. But you really have to sit down and and go through all the things that you need to replicate in this whatever thing that you are buying. Um, and, and see what are the possibilities. But uh, in my experience, cross-functional teams, always the best. Uh, just get like three different team members from three different teams uh, 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 in the room and ask them to just poke holes into this new solution that you're thinking. It's just like when you ask people to poke holes into things, they, they really take a lot of pride into poking holes. And 
it, it comes in very <laughs> handy. I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> uh, at Priceline, we had uh, something called the, the Hacker One program. So we'd actually hire hackers to try to break the site. And then we would have like a backlog of, of vulnerabilities that then all the teams are responsible for. So that was actually a really, really successful program. Okay, so my last question of uh, the panel today is, uh, for each of you, if you want, just provide an example of how you landed, how, do you handle, how you handled managing a digital product that when launched did not meet the level of performance expected by your customers. It never does. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, if it is doing it, then you just too late, that's what I would say. <laughs> Uh, but but it never does. I mean, uh, I think building the context and setting the right expectations is very very important. Uh, to saying it out loud that this is a beta product and it has it might have some bugs, and somehow making them part of your team, saying that hey, we are relying on you to give me some to give us feedback. I mean, it always helps if you know they like you. <laughs> so um, if you have a good relationship with them, uh, I would always do that. I would always say that hey, we are still working on this product. Uh, in fact. In last year and a half, I've done that with three different products at my company, and, and it works great. Uh, you make them part of the process, and because you've set up that context that, hey, this is a beta product, and it might have certain things that might not work, please tell us in detail. People do kind of spend time and send you screenshots and videos of things not working, and you can fix them. Uh, and when you fix them, you, you gain their trust. Like, that's, that's a great thing to have. Uh, you get customers for life. I think it's actually kind of like, uh, contrary, it's kind of like easier when you're launching something because the expectations are set. I mean, people build software, you know things are going to break. Uh, like, uh, the relationship is the key here. Right? You have to make them part of your team. Uh, I mean, your failure is their failure. It's at least the first few customers, it's, it's almost like they're part of your team. So, I mean, like, just setting those expectations right up front. Um, is the key for everything else later on. Like, I mean, it, it takes time for your systems to stabilize and you need more customers and so on and so forth, but your first few relationships hold the key. Nothing else comes closer. There's nothing technical about it at all. So. Okay, well, thank you very much. Let's give it up for Varun, Nadwar, and Gina.